It is taking us all of summer, right here into October, to get through these first eight chapters. So, uh, we are here, we got one, two, we've got four more until we finish the chapter 11. And that's a, yeah, so about four more weeks after this. So, uh, it's been good, it's been exciting. Uh, but Genesis chapter 8 is where we're at. But, um, my, my memory is kind of going really, really quick. So I don't know what I've shared before and what I, what I haven't. So if I repeat things, then, hey, the hungers are good sometimes. So here you go. Uh, this is a little thing that I saw from a 100 years ago. This like, kind of gives you a basis for where we are at today, how far time has passed. But uh, 100 years ago, 1917, the average life expectancy for men was 47 years. Fuel for cars was only sold in drugstores. Only 14% of homes had a bathtub. Wow, how did you bathe? Only 8% of homes had a telephone. The maximum speed limit in most cities was 10 miles an hour. The tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. The average U.S. wage in 1910 was 22 cents an hour. Average U.S. worker made between two and four hundred dollars per year. A competent accountant could expect to earn two thousand per year. A dentist could make two thousand five hundred per year. A veterinarian could make between fifteen hundred and between fifteen hundred and four thousand per year. A mechanical engineer could, at the top, five thousand per year. More than 95% of all births took place at home. 90% of all doctors had no college education. Instead, they attended so-called medical schools, many of which were condemned in the press and the government as substandard. Sugar cost four cents a pound. Eggs were 14 cents per a dozen. Coffee was 15 cents a pound. Most women only washed their hair once a month, and they used borax or egg yolks or shampoo. A couple more. Canada passed a law that prohibited poor people from entering into their country for any reason. Five leading causes of death were pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea, heart disease, and stroke. The American flag had 45 stars. The population of Las Vegas, Nevada was only 30. Crossword puzzles, canned beer and iced tea hadn't been invented yet. It was neither Mother's Day nor Father's Day. Two out of every ten adults could not read or write. Only 6% of all Americans had graduated from high school. Marijuana, heroin, and morphine were all available over the counter as local at the local drugstore. Back then, the pharmacist said heroin clears the complexion, gives buoyancy to the mind, regulates the stomach, Bells and is in fact a perfect guardian of health. All right, where's where's our PA <laughs> prescription? All right, uh, eighteen percent of households had at least one full-time servant or domestic help. That would be nice. And at last, there were about two hundred and thirty reported murders in the entire United States. That was a hundred years. Times have changed. Times have really changed. Scripture says that there's a time and purpose for everything under heaven. So there's a time, there's a beginning, and there's an end. To everything, there is a season. Everything, there's a season. You go through a bad time, there's a season for that. That's going to end. Don't do a good time. There's a season. There's a beginning. There's an end to it. There's an ebb and flow to every single life. There's a cycle to it all. But the thing is that God oversees all of it. And when you place your heart, your life into his hands, there's a purpose. But if you're not in the palm of his hands, it just seems like up and down and craziness and misery. So, the ebb and flow of life. The 
before we're going to take a look here, Genesis chapter 8. And what we're going to take a look at here is about the recession of the waters. Okay, it was a disaster, worldwide disaster. Happened in the time of Noah. And we're seeing, yes, God provided judgment and devastation upon the surf. But at the end of the judgment, he provides restoration. He provides a fresh start. That no matter what happens, God always says, all right, let's start over again. Let's do something new. Let's have a fresh start. So, let's get a little review. What we find in Scripture is that evil reigned on this earth, and God, in His grief, He He grieved. He He said, "You know, I regret creating man." And evil and violence was extreme upon this earth, and He said, "I'm going to cause judgment to come upon this earth, and it would be in the form of the flood." There was only one man who stood up for God. One man and his family were chosen to survive this calamity, and his name was Noah. There were eight in his entire family, him, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. He was instructed to build an ark. And that ark would house him and all the living things that breathed air on this land. He spent 120 years constructing this said ark. He only had to bring kinds of animals into the ark and not species. And so uh, he had the opportunity to house abundantly all of the, the created uh, creatures on this earth on just one single level of the ark. There were three decks uh, to the ark. And so uh, all the animals could have just been on one uh, singular deck. Uh, 120 years passed from the time that God instructed him to build this ark to the time that the rain started falling. Last week we found that the fountains of the deep <coughs> broke up. It started raining and it didn't let up for 40 days and for 40, 40 nights. 150 days passes until the ark actually rests upon the mountains of Ararat. And 74 days pass until the tops of the mountains become visible. After 40 days, Noah takes some action. The waters can, uh, continue to recede. And as, as a result of all this devastation, you see billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that is where we are at right now. What does God do? At this point, they're waiting. Massive flood. Genesis chapter 8 is where we begin. And the first thing I want us to take a note of, if you're following along on your outline, is that God always remembers his people. God remembers his people. Look at verse 8. It says, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Verse 2, now the springs of the deep, the floodgates of the heaven had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down and on the 17th day, the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. The question here is as you begin reading this, it says that God remembered. Okay, now in our modern day thinking, we think, okay, God remembered. All right, here's this guy on the boat. Oh, I forgot about this guy. You know, he's, been, he's been out there for a while. Ah, let's just go take. No, that's, that's what we think when we think about remembering. We think we associate that with forgetting. You know, if God is omniscient, all knowing, then does that mean he forgot? Now, this is the important thing that when we read the word remember, in our English rendering and in our Hebrew rendering, there's a little bit of difference between the two of them. So in English, when we hear remember, we're thinking about uh, memories. We're thinking about recalling ideas into our thoughts. Our concept is con concerned entirely with mental activity and whether or not information is present or, or not. 
So for us, remembering and forgetting is entirely a mental activity. But in Hebrew, that, you know, Hebrew is a word poor language. And so what you have happening is that when they use the word remember it, it conveys something a little bit deeper than what we have in our in our uh, English memory. So yes, they have the thoughts that are associated with it, but one thing that we need to understand, when you read Hebrew, it also has action associated with it. Okay? So English, just meaning thoughts, I'm remembering this, remember our anniversary, remember birthdays, information. But with Hebrew, it's thoughts plus action. So it takes into consideration of what we read here. So take, for example, Genesis chapter 19, verse 29. It says, thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley. Remember that? Sodom and Gomorrah laid waste. That God remembered Abraham. Notice what you see happening after the word remembered is there. It says, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, which he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. So you notice what happens there? God remembers, so it's the thoughts, plus there's action associated with it. Okay, same thing happens here in Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, that God remembered Rachel. So what happened? God listened to her and opened her womb. So anytime you hear the word remember or forget in Scripture, you have to think, okay, there is the mental aspect, but there's also an action aspect to it. So it's not just the mental part of it. And so when we read these passages, there is an emphasis on action. So God remembered Noah. So what did he do? Cause the waters to recede. Cause the land to appear. That is the, the action part of it. Now I want us to notice verses 4 and 5 because there's a really great little tidbit in here. Okay? It says, on the 17th day of the 7th month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Not necessarily Mount Ararat, okay, but the mountains. So we don't know exactly where this would, this resting place for the ark would have occurred. So on the, notice that it happens on the 17th day, the 7th month. Okay, keep that in your mind because you fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus... He died on Passover, the 14th day of the seventh month. How long was Jesus in the grave? Three, three, three days. Just add that to that, okay? Notice the day that Jesus rose again. Jesus rose on the 17th day of the seventh month. So the same date that the ark hit dry land was the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. A little bit of connection there. But that's an important little tidbit for us to understand that God brings hope at the very end of disaster. Here we have the ark burning the ground and it's been devastating. All earth is void of light except for what's on that, that ark. God says, all right, I'm going to bring restoration to you. Jesus was dead. There was no hope. His disciples were running, scared. Then on the 17th day of the seventh month, hope sprang anew. God had a purpose and plan for every single little detail along the way. So God remembers his people. No matter what you're going through today, he remembers you. And not only does he think about you, but he has actions to support you along the way. He remembers you today. No matter what you're going through, he's there for you. Number two, the Lord provides restoration after judgment. He provides restoration after judgment. And this is what I notice all throughout Scripture. Every time that Jesus, or the Lord, Jehovah God, comes along the scene and he provides judgment, on people, he's always saying, come back to me. I want you to come back to me. I want to love you. I want to restore my relationship with you. And this is what happens right here. And it's just a, an example of all the incidents. I'm giving you another chance. I'm giving you a fresh start. No matter what you've gone through, no matter the mistakes you've made, 
uh, providing you another chance to restore things as they should be. And so what the Lord provides is restoration at their judgment. Look at verse 6. It says, After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark. He sent out a raven. Okay, a raven is a scavenger. Okay, a raven can hover, fly along, scavenge for things. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Well, this thing just kind of flew around. Then he sent out a dove. Now, notice a dove is not a scavenger, but and it can't hover. So it, it just flaps all the time, flapping along to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground, verse 9, but the dove could not find, could find nowhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth, so it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand, took the dove, brought it back to himself in the ark. No open land yet. So he waited, verse 10, seven more days, sent out the dove from the ark, and when the dove returned to him in the evening there, and his beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days, sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him, which would have been a clear sign that it was suitable land. This thing isn't flapping around anymore. It was found a place to nest. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth, and Noah then removed the covering from the ark saw that the surface of the ground was dry, and by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. So after judgment, God provided this opportunity for renewal. He always extends his merciful hand. There's a question here. In, in days, how long was the flood? How long was he on the ark? Genesis 7, 11, and Genesis 8, 14 give the exact dates of the beginning and the end of the flood, revealing an elapsed time of 12 months and 10 or 11 days. Kind of depending upon how one might count the first and last. If the calendar consisted of 12 30-day months, there would have been 360 days in a year. This would result in a flood that was 370 or 371 days long. That's a long time to be cooped up with a lot of living creatures and your family. You know, it's it's tough when you get together with family around Thanksgiving. It's just about you know eight nine hours is as much as you can handle. You know, <laughs> gathered around the table arguing over football teams and politics and things like that. But that was a long time. Three hundred seventy one days aboard that ark. So a little bit over a year. When they stepped off of the ark, this is the question, what was it like? Alright, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6 says, The world that then existed perished. So it was drastically different. They had, when they, they went, when they were on the ark at the very beginning, at the beginning of 371 days, oh, things looked pretty nice. Then the flood came, when they stepped off, it was much different. It's like people calling you and saying, hey, I see you're from Montana. How close are you to Kalispell? <laughs> like, we're in the eastern dry side that nobody ever visits. So it's like we're night and day. You know, they got mountains and trees. We're like, wow, where are the big green things? growing up there on top of your, your hills over there. No. It's like night and day. It's like different climate, different politics, different mindset from one side of the state to the other. Imagine what it's like for Noah at the beginning. Kind of familiar area and then flood comes and it's like, what in the world just happened? Disaster. It says the world that then existed perished. It was unrecognizable, being flooded with, with water. It was much different. The recession of the waters would have caused many significant effects in the middle of the continents. There would have been masses of large water left. 
some of these would have burst forth gouging out canyons, like Grand Canyon. Um, it also would have been a different, a different climactic environment. It's theorized that the early Earth was even more subtropical. And then all of a sudden he steps off and what is going on here? It's at this point that a lot of uh, creation scientists say, hey, this is when an ice age would have happened. Let's take a look at this little uh, theory by AIP Answers in Genesis. The ice on Greenland and Antarctica is in places miles deep and hundreds of miles wide. In the present, however, all but the edges of these ice sheets are cold deserts. Not enough snow and ice falls there to build up the depth of ice that we find today, even if long periods of time are available. The flood of the Bible may provide an answer. First of all, Flood rocks contain thick piles of lava and huge volumes of volcanic ash. Meteorologist Mike Ord has suggested that this might have led to the Ice Age. It, there was a lot of uh, uh, warm water uh, added to the, the pre-flood oceans uh, from the crust, and also a lot of lava flows and volcanism that heat the water. Evidence and fossils suggest that the oceans were warmed up in the course of the flood. The average temperature in the ocean is 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, after the flood, it could have been an average of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And you could have taken a swim in the Arctic Ocean uh, right after the flood, it was so warm. But then it's, it start cooling down, and that cooling is mainly by evaporation. So uh, the key here is that um, with that warm water, you evaporate so much more uh, water vapor from the air. As the oceans cooled after the flood, heavy snow began to fall. Computer simulations that begin with warm oceans show snow falling far inland over cool continents. Ice sheets build up thousands of feet thick where we see evidence for such ice today. This ice built up in only a few centuries of time. The whole process was sped up by volcanic ash cooling the earth after the flood. Yeah, because of the instability of the earth after the flood, There'd be a lot of volcanism. Aerosols are tiny uh, particles about a, a, a micron in diameter, and they'll float up there in the stratosphere for several years, and they reflect sunlight back to space. So you have a cooling mechanism. The ice is going to build up, and then finally it's going to come to a point where it's going to peak. That's glacial maximum. Once the oceans cooled enough, and the evaporation slowed, the snows stopped, and the ice began to melt. Calculations suggest that the build-up movement and melting of ice did not require many thousands of years as is traditionally taught. From a warm world at the end of the flood to the melting of the ice took only centuries of time. And then I see evidence of the one ice age, a short, rapid ice age that melts catastrophically. This is what I see uh, uh, based on science. Present climate is not the key to understanding what produced thick piles of ice in Greenland and Antarctica. It looks like the Bible had the key all along, the great flood in the days of Noah. So I believe right after a flood, pretty soon thereafter, there would have been, a, been an ice age. Um, and it doesn't take millions of years or thousands of years in order for thick layers of ice to develop. Remember last week we were talking about the, the lost World War II squadron, you know, buried under 220 feet of ice, okay, up in the, the Arctic. Didn't take millions of years to bury that squadron. Well, it just took several storms. Um, not every single layer is a year, it's just a single storm that happens. So what uh, occurs, it just simply takes a little bit of time and a lot of water for the conditions that are present right now to, to exist. Um, take a look at verse 15. And uh, let's uh, take a look at what other conditions were present. Um, 
it says, when God said to Noah, come out of the ark, and your wife, and your sons, and their wives. That's probably a reassuring statement. Bring every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So the very first thing that God tells Noah what to do is, all right, this is a brand new fresh start. I want you to fill this earth. And uh, what we're going to find out next week when we, uh, when we, when we study, study it in chapter 9 is that we're going to talk about how, how today's current population, only 7, 8 billion people could have originated, originated in that amount of time from 8 people. How that, just doing the simple math, you can come up with today's uh, population uh, right here, right now. But if uh, man existed, as a popular uh, theory will say, man existed for millions of years, you know, then the population should be just astronomical. And we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, next week. Uh, but the verse also indicates animals were... Uh, taken from the ark, and then they were also instructed to go and uh, refill the earth. So let's take a little little video uh, clip of this. This is about the movement of plants, the movement of animals, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along in the next week or so. But uh, uh, how uh, the animals and the plants uh, started to to uh, refill the earth from this portion of history. The distribution of wildlife poses some puzzles for modern biologists. Why do we find giant land tortoises on islands in the Pacific Ocean and 10,000 miles away in the Indian Ocean, but nowhere in between? Why do we find identical plants on either side of the Atlantic Ocean? These kinds of disjunct or split ranges can't be explained by the way organisms travel and live in the present. The worldwide flood described in the Bible and its effects on the earth may offer essential clues to explain these split ranges. Of course, many fish were able to survive outside the ark. Even freshwater animals could survive. Many people don't realize that fresh water from rivers like the Amazon can float for years above the ocean without mixing. So freshwater animals could survive the flood in fresh water floating above the salty ocean water. Many plants that weren't on the ark could have floated during the flood, some even in the floating freshwater. As the floodwaters receded, plants and fish would have been left behind at lakes and other places around the world. Many plants would have continued to float, providing a way to distribute animals after the flood. After Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, Hundreds of thousands of Douglas fir trees were ripped up and remained floating on the lake 25 years later. If Noah's flood ripped up every forest in the world, mats of trees probably stayed afloat for centuries. As winds blew these enormous log mats in circular paths in the oceans, they would have served as rafts for animals to cross oceans. Rafts may also explain how tortoises got to remote islands. Interestingly, most modern animals and plants with ranges split across oceans follow the pattern of modern currents. Their distribution can be explained by rafting. In this way, the flood and its aftermath provide a solution for one of the many mysteries of biology, split ranges. So between that and also an ice age, you would see a lot of distribution of, of animals and of, of mankind uh, throughout the earth. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we uh, get into next week and then also in chapter 11 when we get into the Tower of Babel. But here we go. What was Noah's response to all this? It was worship. It was worship. 
Look at verse uh, verse 18 through through uh, 21. It says, So Noah came out together with his sons, with his wife's sons, all the animals and all the creatures that moved along the ground, all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. So then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So you notice what his first reaction to all this it was to simply stop and to give thanks. Simply worship. You notice that's what happens in, in the New Testament. It says, in everything, give thanks. Not just for the good times, but for those tough times as well. I had a chance just even this past week and just just walking along, and just so many activities, so many things that are going on from, from the volleyball games to football games and then working soccer and the, the weekends and, and uh, meetings and things like that. And, and then I just simply took a step back looking at all the schedule and I'm like, you know what, God, I'm just so thankful. Every single little gift and I see my kids just growing up and I'm like, thank you God for, for blessing us. And I just kind of was able to take a little step back and say, thank you Lord for all that you've done. And we, just have to get step away from your current situation and just look at all the things that God has and most of done in your life. The first response that we should have to every situation is to worship. Um, that's what Noah does here. And then notice uh, the last one is that God provides his reassurance. We'll talk a little bit more about this in detail next week. But he provides hope. He provides his promise of, of his presence. Uh, look at verse 22. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. And that a good promise right there? We were pretty much despairing when we had this drought. Like, oh, the world is ending. And then you read verse two, 22. As long as this earth endures, you're going to have heat and cold. We'll provide different seasons. To everything, Ecclesiastes, to everything, there is a season, a time and purpose for everything under heaven. There will be a beginning to your trial, and let me tell you, there will be an end to it. Scripture says that you will not be tempted beyond that which you are able. But God will provide a way out. He'll provide a way of escape. There's a beginning to your trial and there will be an end to it. First time that uh, that really took a hold of me was when I was in in high school. That first that God provide a way out. I remember just being kind of picked on and bullied and like, God, I don't know what's going on here. This is too much for me. And I prayed about it. I remember just one day, it just kind of diminished. And God provided a way out. And I'm like, Lord, this is... I should have really took your word at face value. I was in 7th or 8th grade when I first prayed, God, I know that as Scripture says, there's going to be a, a path out of this difficult circumstance. I'm going to trust you. I was like, well, you really did mean that there's going to be an end to the there's going to be a beginning to your trial, and there's going to be an end, and it will pass. No matter what you're facing here today, He will never allow you to be tested beyond that which you are able. He will always provide a way of escape. I had a chance uh, this past weekend, we're going to end it on this. Uh, you guys know Mark Lowry? Okay, he, uh, he's with the the Gaither vocal band, but he's more of the humorist kind of guy. But he tells a story, and it takes a little bit of time for him to get to his point, but this is good. Okay, and he 
just details. Okay, there's a beginning to your trial, there's an end to it. God will take care of you through it all. Let's take a listen to him.
or if you have provided for your children in the desert for years and years, or if you have allowed that one lady to reach out and touch the hem of your robe, knowing that she would be healed by that healing touch, or if you are still that same God today, as you were back then, and I know that you are, from you were saying yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, since you are that same God, we're going to say, we're going to be still. We're going to trust you in all of the life circumstances. You're going to provide for us. You're going to sustain us through the good times, through the bad. And so, Lord, we reach out for your hem of your boat and say, Lord Jesus, we need you today. We trust you. We surrender all. Lord, take these truths that we have learned today, apply them to our hearts throughout this week, knowing that we are in the precious palm of your hand. And that is a safe, wonderful place to be. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time. Dismiss us now with your blessing. All of this. We pray in Jesus' name.